Today, Sasha Knapp is testing the Skoda Superb, the firm's flagship car. He says it's had a facelift. A lot has been done to the exterior. There are new aspects to the front and the rear. The interior has also been given an overhaul. There's a 2.0 TDI diesel engine that produces 103 kilowatts of power. The new diesel models and the standard petrol model all feature start-stop systems and regenerative braking. According to Skoda, average fuel consumption is 5.3 liters. The test version costs 36,290 euros, loaded with all the extras. The standard model is available for some 13,000 euros less. Sasha explains that the Skoda Superb is available as a station wagon and sedan. He says there's plenty of space in the back of the sedan, just as it should be. A lot has been done to the interior of this flagship car, he says. There are new interior color schemes and a new multifunctional steering wheel. The colors complement each other, and the overall impression is good. The revamped second generation is very good looking, featuring new by Xenon headlights, integrated LED daytime running lights, and LED blinkers. The hood design features powerful lines. LED tail lights at the rear are brighter than in the past, and these come as part of the standard package. There's plenty of space in back, although some taller people might have preferred more room above their heads. Like in the old version, the new Superb's hatch can open in two different ways. You can push open the button part only, or the whole door, including the back windshield, depending on your needs. There are now two new buttons to make this even easier. Sasha says it's a very smooth drive. Bumps are taken without passengers even noticing. And even if you make a fast turn, you maintain a good feel for the road and can easily keep the car under control. With the Superb, Skoda is reaching out from the medium-sized to luxury market. And compared to its more expensive counterparts, made by Audi or BMW, the Skoda Superb has nothing to be ashamed of. The Skoda Superb confirms the good impression that we already had of it. It's a very spacious sedan car with plenty of legroom. Both the station wagon and sedan models of the Superb are already available in Germany. On July 4th, the 16th annual Silvetra Classic Rally got underway. And for the fourth time, electric cars were part of the field, while the vintage classics won over a new generation of fans. This time, there was a slight change. The classics and plug-ins started off together, rather than separately as they had in the past. Even some of the vintage cars had been converted to the new technology. One vintage classic after another rolls off the starting ramp. But before they do, each driver gets a little good luck charm from two local children in vintage dress. In sharp contrast to the vintage cars are the electric vehicles of 22 EVs, such as the Mercedes SLS AMG Electric Drive Coupe. Everyone drives at their own pace. Some take their time and enjoy the countryside. The EVs are well advised to drive economically. 
The electric smart stands out from the rest with its LED daytime running lights and city street driving design. Some cars are in a hurry, like this Audi Quattro, and take advantage of a few stretches of open road. The odd one out is the only privately owned fuel cell powered Mercedes B-Class. The owner Klaus Ega gives his impression. It's just beautiful. You get a whole new feeling behind the wheel. You're more conscious of energy consumption and the environment when driving. But you have to think about finding the right filling station well in advance because not many of them are equipped for it yet. There are currently only a handful of hydrogen filling stations in Germany. Some of the rally drivers are still climbing the high Alpine Silvetra road, while others are already headed back down the same way. On this rally, there's always time to enjoy the scenery. Before the day is over, both the vintage car and EV drivers have to pass a special stage. The idea is to drive a certain distance in a predetermined time as precisely as possible. The spectators are waiting at the finish line with a bottle of sparkling wine as a gift to each driver. Later on the market square, the spectators have a chance to see the cars close up. And what do the vintage car buffs say about the plug-ins? It's odd when they come along so quietly and then here it is. I think it's the future of cars. I think like in the next 20 years, everything will be electric. Modern technology is good to see, but the classics aren't bad either. He has never driven an EV, but would like to try it sometime. Others wouldn't hear of it. This man says a real engine has to have at least 12 cylinders. Urban Priel says it's time people change their way of thinking about new cars. Certain things just need to be taken good care of, and they'll last longer. It's been calculated that driving a car for 20 years will use about the same amount of energy resources as it takes to manufacture and then scrap it. So it makes sense to keep a car and drive it just as long as possible. Getting an electric car to drive as long and as far as possible is the aim of current research and development on EVs, such as the hybrid XL1 from Volkswagen. The smart electric drive is already on the market. In Germany, it starts at just over 13,000 euros. Johannes Eck of Mercedes says there are different applications for different automotive technologies. The Smart with the battery electric drive has been in high volume series production since last year, selling direct to the end consumer. That shows that the car is practical for every day and can be produced in series. Of course, the fuel cell is the more modern, costlier and newer technology. And this car proves these new technologies can achieve a very long range. So it has qualities from both drive systems. The Silvetra Classic Rally in Montafon also puts qualities from vintage classics and state-of-the-art electric cars on the road together. VW has launched the station wagon version of its new Golf 7. The Golf variant is around 105 kilograms lighter and offers 100 liters more storage space than its predecessor. It also is powered by new petrol and diesel engines, which consume up to 15% less fuel. An advanced XDS Plus electronic differential lock for perfect cornering is standard. A dynamic control chassis is also available. With their new 911 Turbo, Porsche makes the move from active to adaptive aerodynamics. This model is a world first. The front spoiler adjusts itself to suit the speed. 
and the rear wing extends and tilts into different positions. Combined, this brings together everyday suitability with driving stability, efficiency, and performance. Our test driver Matas Kurat is taking a special vehicle out for a spin. He tells us that when you're on rugged terrain, a construction site, or in a quarry, as he is here, then an all-wheel drive vehicle like the Mercedes GL is just the thing. But if you want to take home some gravel, well, think of the mess it would make in the GL. And what about a digger, he says, saying that's why he's got Matthias Lichter along for the ride in this wonderful quarry in Wuppertal, where they're taking a look at the new Mercedes-Benz Arox. Lichter says they'll take a little drive first. Getting into the 8.5 meter long and 3.8 meter high truck is a challenge for anyone with a fear of heights. These giants can be configured for two, four, six, or eight wheel drive. Matis is looking at the biggest Arox. It weighs in at 41 tons. Mata says that when you're in the cab, it's not much different from a conventional truck. So what sets Arox apart from the other Mercedes truck Actros? Wo sind denn die signifikanten Unterschiede jetzt zwischen dem Actros und dem Arox? Matthias Lichter tells us that the Arox has a more robust interior than a street truck. It can be wiped down and doesn't scratch easily. The Arox also has more of a differential lock than a street truck would, and they're all on the shifter because there's only one sequence for operating the locks, and they're listed on a rotating switch so that inexperienced drivers will get it right. But there's far more than all-wheel drive, differential locks, and robust materials to set the all-terrain truck apart from its streetwise Savier sibling, the Actros. Matthias Lichter explains that street vehicles are normally equipped with air shocks, particularly if they're tractor trailers. The cab usually has steel suspension in front and air suspension in back. On construction sites, he says, steel suspension is more common, especially if the terrain is really rough. Matthias tells us a truck body is torsionally flexible with a relatively narrow chassis, which helps with the flexibility and, of course, a more robust frame with thicker metal components. The Arox looks like a solid wall, and it's extremely robust, as its rugged steel lines and caged-in headlights underscore. And there's plenty of clearance, making it ideal for off-road. There are no aluminum rims here. The space for the springs is as large as the entire wheel well on some cars. Different models are available to suit different uses. There's a dump attachment, a cement mixer, and even a model to pull a trailer. Sixteen different types of engine are available, ranging from 7.7 .7 to 15.6 liters with maximum torque ranging from an amazing 1,000 to 3,000 newton meters. And all of them meet Euro 6 emission standards, even when they're putting out up to 460 kilowatts of power. Our test vehicle has a 380 kilowatt engine in it. That's plenty of power for most jobs. After all, construction vehicles don't actually race. The gray giant can climb too. 40% slopes are no problem for the Arox, and if the stones come loose, the Arox just rolls downhill. Usually, Matas works for us on the road. He says he's learned something on this off-road assignment. First, he says all trucks are not the same. Second, a tough vehicle can handle tough terrain. 
And third, if you want to build a house away from civilization, ask your contractor if they have an Arox in their fleet to get supplies to the job site. As Matthias Lichter is doing here. A garage in Munich. This is where vintage fan Richard Orthuber guards his most precious treasure, an Amphicar model 770 built 50 years ago. Orthuber tells us that the basic idea behind Amphicar, designed by constructor Hans Trippel, was to create a car that could travel both on land and on water. Triple's idea was that driving over mountains wasn't as important as crossing rivers. He didn't see much need for off-roaders. He wanted a car for water and land. To drive on water, the Amphicar needed some very special extra features. That's the horn. These are the navigation lights, like you see on a motorboat. They're green and red, and enable distant ships to see which direction he's going in. To ensure the hood closes tight with the rubber seals, it is fixed in place using two square key locks. Construction constraints meant that only the rear wheels are powered, says Richard. All-wheel drive would have been ideal for getting out of the water, but if you get stuck, it also comes with a tow hook. Up front, it has a double floor, like any other boat, so your feet stay dry. The water that does come in at the front, plus the inevitable spray from waves, drains off quickly below, via the double floor, and into the bilge. At the back, there's a bilge pump to remove the water from the vessel. Richard then powers up the little four-cylinder engine, originally hailing from a Triumph Herald. Packing just 38 horsepower, the Autobahns are no place for the Amphicar. Slow country roads are far more up its alley. The Amphicar is practically a boat on wheels. It has a higher center of gravity, which means it's pretty vulnerable around bends. You just have to take it out onto the water, enthuses Richard. It's more boat than car. The four-speed transmission was taken from a Tempo Matador van. Then a water reverse gear was fitted. Today, Richard is motoring out on the Chiemsee in Bavaria. The moment the car hits the water and dives down at the front, I still get nervous every time. You always wonder whether it will sink or swim. It's all metal at the front and back and has bolts everywhere. If there's a leak anywhere, it'll go down like a rock. But it works every time, and that's fascinating. Just when you thought it was safe to back onto the water, a whole fleet of Amphicars appears on the horizon. Richard is here at the lake to meet some other enthusiasts. They provide an extra surprise for tourists on the passenger boats. Steering is just like with a car, explains Richard, via the front wheels. With regular boats, you use rudders, and in this case, tires. But they work. The only thing that's different are the brakes. So, let's get moving. On the water, Amphicars can reach up to 12 kilometers an hour. But even at such slow speeds, in Germany you need an extra motorboat license to drive this baby across lakes or rivers. Two hours later, land ahoy. The car is at a bit of an angle. Any water that has entered the boat during the journey should have run towards the back. Richard Orthuber wants to see whether the bilge pump is in action. And lo and behold. Another adventure that the Amphicar has survived unscathed. 
Richard couldn't imagine selling his prized possession. Maybe his daughters will take an interest one day. But for now, he'll keep on servicing it. The cars are gradually disappearing, he says. Most are now in collector's hands, but nobody's going to get his.